Thank you for having me. Um, I uh, started, there we go. I uh, started my educational path um, at Cal State Los Angeles. Um, I was unusual perhaps um, in some ways in that the moment I stepped on the campus, I decided this is what I want to do. <laughs> um, so I decided I wanted to um, be in higher education. I wanted to be a professor. Um, and I'd always had an interest in uh, psychology. So uh, sometimes when I'm mentoring students or talking to students about career paths and stuff, you know, they don't not just be aware. You know, when you work with uh, students at a primarily undergraduate school, they may not be like us in the sense that you know they uh, may have you know, had that desire to get a, a doctorate, be a professor, um, perhaps from early on. In my case, again, that's, that's, that's kind of how it worked. Um, so I developed a really good mentoring relationship with a, a professor who's actually emeritus, um, but he still had his lab, and he took me under his wing and provided a lot of um, guidance and mentorship and took me to conferences and got me involved in research um, at, at Cal State LA. Um, and then I went to UCLA. And uh, graduated from there, and I always wanted to teach, so um, kind of had to navigate, you know, that transition um, from being at a R1 type, very you know, research-driven institution to uh, developing a, a career that was in teaching. Um, so that is a little different, and um, I had support, but I didn't have a lot of like. <laughs> uh, faculty around me or other individuals that had experience um, uh, teaching at a Cal State or at a four-year college or at a community college. Um, so it, it was certainly a lot of learning <laughs> um, that, that was sort of involved for me. Um, and one thing that you will, um, oops, hang on a second. There we go. Sorry. One thing that um, uh, for me was always really rewarding was that idea of being able to integrate um, scholarship with teaching, um, uh, and I think it came out of having that a really good and helpful mentoring type relationship with a, um, a faculty member. So I, I have that as sort of a frame of reference, and I wanted to be the you know the faculty member that could sort of provide that for students. Um, and so the teacher scholar model is appealing to me because of that. Um, it's also um, you know if, if I think we're lucky in a sense if we can say, you know, we're going to start a career and it's going to, things are going to go so well that you're going to do it for 20 or 30 years or something, right? And I know at this point in your life, you're not really thinking that, but again, you know, a lot of faculty stay faculty <laughs> for the duration of, of their career. You're going to hopefully, if you love it, um, be doing it for a long time. And I think that having that connection with research um, and scholarship is good because it sort of invigorates you um, and it keeps you sort of um, connected um, to things that are changing in our um, respective fields. So it's, it's really helpful um, in that sense. And I think ideally it also nurtures our courses, right, and, and keeps our courses sort of fresh and, um, and interesting as well. Um, but again, it also really key for me is mentoring um, students. So there are a lot of really good reasons to um, sort of, you know, find that teacher-scholar combination sort of appealing. Um, and so as I was preparing for this, um, you know, I don't, we're, you know, we're, we teach, we go to committee meetings and do a bunch of other stuff, but it's not always that we have a chance to kind of reflect on what we're doing. So this was sort of my chance to kind of reflect on what we're doing. So I was like, okay, you know, let me see what we know about <laughs> teacher scholar. Um, and so there, there is a very recent report on it. Um, and really at the heart of it is that all students must master the arts of inquiry and innovation. And so that's an important factor. Um, we can certainly do that. Uh, in many ways, but one way is by um, guiding students uh, in, in research. Um, and I found this really interesting. Um, the darker bars are the number of hours spent um, doing research, depending on whether you're at a, uh, a PhD granting institution over here, or bachelor's or master's um, degree level institutions. And you can see that, you know, it, it, the number of hours of research you do does differ. But in the lighter um, shade, we see the number of hours spent 
working with undergraduates on research, and that's constant. <laughs> so regardless of whether you're at a PhD granting institution or at a bachelor's level institution, it seems like there's a lot, you know, just uh, kind of a similarity in the number of hours spent per week by faculty um, working with um, students. And then over here, I'm not sure if I can, ah, yes. Um, we can see that there is sort of a you know, positive correlation between um, how um, important faculty perceive undergraduate research is and how likely those students are to be involved in um, scholarship as well in research. So there is sort of you know, this uh, carving out of time to work with students on research and uh, uh, providing that opportunity, and it's, it seems like that faculty viewing it as an important thing is a, a good um, prognosis for, you know, for, for, for uh, or predictor, I should say, for how students are gonna, um, how likely students are to get involved in research. Um, now that said, <laughs> your time is limited. There are, can be a lot of different competing, um, uh, you know, demands on your time. Um, and so that's where the tension comes with being teacher scholar. Yes, the benefits are there. It's wonderful. It's fulfilling. But boy, it can really kind of create a lot of tension um, uh, in terms of demands for your time and, and what's important prioritizing. Um, so one big factor is just teaching load. And I'm, that's something that you're, you know, at some point going to be dealing with, right? Um, so right now you're primarily students, um, I'm guessing, and then you will be transitioning to some other type of career where there'll be some teaching, but how much, right? And it can really vary dramatically. Um, and so it's a matter of finding the, a, a place that's a good fit for you that will allow you to accomplish your goals um, and also just to be realistic. So a lot of um, undergraduate um, schools that are primarily teaching based, they might have a um, you know, nine unit teaching load first semester, so three three-unit classes. Um, at a Cal State University, um, our teaching load is 12 units, um, at least once. Your, your first two years, we give you a break. You only have to do nine units um, per semester. But after that, you'll be responsible for teaching 12 units per semester. And for some people, that's just like, you can kind of see it in their face when they come interview. And they just like go, no. <laughs> like, you know, because that, that is a lot. Um, now, there are ways of making that work and making it not be quite as, as stressful. Uh, but it is a lot, and it means that that leaves limited time for your research activity. So again, that tension, right? Teacher, scholar, <laughs> um, ends up being kind of a, a, a place where there can be some, some conflict sometimes or some, some you know, different uh, expectations. Um, and it's also important to be mindful that if you do try and develop a career at an institution that um, holds up that teacher-scholar model um, and applies it, that that means that you will have to be a good teacher, an effective teacher, a caring teacher, to be able to go successfully through the transition through the, the tenure and promotion process um, so you can you know, transition through your career. Um, and you also have to meet whatever the established um, expectations are for scholarly productivity. Um, and it depends on, you know, there are a lot of variations, but at some point you have to produce something, <laughs> right, typically. Um, so different programs, different departments, different you know, uh, universities will have different sets of expectations. It's important, though, um, that when you do make an on-campus interview and when you visit, that's a really good question to ask, <laughs> um, is to ask, okay, so to be tenured in blank in you know, history or psychology or whatever it is, what are the requirements? How many publications? What are the nature of the publications? Just explore that, you know, have that conversation with them. And they should be very forthcoming about that. If they're not, there's a problem. <laughs> you know, that, that, is not, should, that should not be some kind of industrial secret. Um, so they should be very forthcoming and supportive um, and, and want to talk to you about uh, what the requirements are for um, successful uh, tenure. So they should be able to tell you, you know, like in our case, uh, basically it comes down to, well, you, in the first six years, you need to have three um, uh, publications or the equivalent, you know, and we can kind of talk about that. Um, so be, be kind of, you know, willing to engage in that conversation and you should see how they respond. I think that'll be an important factor. You want to go someplace where you're wanted? 
<laughs> right? I mean, um, and so I think if you're being interviewed somewhere and you start talking about this, they should want to really have that conversation with you because it means that, yes, they are looking at you as a potential um, colleague and they want you to be successful. Um, so that's really kind of important. You know, you pick up on that, that vibe a little bit that, hey, okay, they want to have that conversation. Um, it's important not to neglect your research, especially because, you know, when you're first starting out, you're developing new courses, you're pre preparing new courses. It is very time intensive. Um, after your first year, you're going to probably start having demands on your time in terms of service commitments, and that can be, you know, committee meetings and um, being advisor to the psychology club, in my case, or whatever it ends up being in, in your particular field. Um, so it is a challenge sometimes to carve out that time um, for research if, if you are working someplace that uh, um, expects you to be teacher and scholar. Um, and, um, you know, in, in general, um, when you interview, um, again, these are just things you just want to have a very frank and open conversation about. Um, we are usually looking for people that will be happy at Cal State Channel Islands, um, uh, that will be successful at Cal State Channel Islands, and who understand our mission, who get it, and who, you know, that's what they want. Um, and again, these are for tenure track positions. You know, we're making that sort of investment because you're going to be our colleague for a long time, hopefully, right? So we want you to be happy. We want this to be a good place for you. We don't want someone to come in and feel like we killed their career, <laughs> you know, they're, because we threw so much teaching at them that they weren't able to do much else and really live the kind of um, academic life that they were hoping for. We want it to be a good fit. Um, and so it's not a good fit for everybody, certainly. Um, uh, you know, we can think about it in terms of percentages, but, you know, if you really think that your ideal mix of teaching and scholarship is, oh, I think I want to do like 20% teaching and, you know, 80% scholarship, um, uh, I can tell you Cal State is not going to be, you know, <laughs> where you're happy. Um, and I think it, for, in general, just about any un primarily undergraduate institution is not where you're going to be happy. Um, so just be aware of that, you know, that different institutions have different missions and different expectations. Um, so, it, you know, find, find a place that's, that's, that's going to make you happy and that's going to bring out those passions in you. Um, and speaking of passion, it really is so good to, especially when you go on that interview, to bring with you that passion you do have for your research. Um, you may not do a lot of it. You know, I don't publish real quickly, <laughs> you know, like I did in grad school and shortly thereafter. It's a different, definitely for me it's been, you know, a slower pace. Um, but I feel like I still have a huge amount of passion for my research. Um, so that, I think, is an important thing. It keeps us going, you know, it keeps us productive, and it keeps us um, being able to sort of suck students into, you know, uh, an area of research because we have that kind of passion and excitement for it. So when you're interviewing, again, you know, when you're doing that job talk and when you're interacting with undergraduates, share, you know, show it. You all have a huge amount of expertise and you have a huge amount of passion for what you're studying and learning about and um, doing so share it you know um, and and that'll be another good sign that you know if you can manage the teaching load that you will also make time for, for research we don't also we also don't want someone that's going to say yeah I want to go teach at a Cal State but you know after like five or six years once I get tenure I don't think I really want to you know do any more publications or do any more research I think I just kind of want to you know <laughs> no we're not looking for that either so we want someone that has that that passion um, so that they can um, you know sort of keep it make it a part of their um, long-term trajectory you know so we are definitely um, looking for that so realistically um, in terms of you know what makes a good fit um, at a primarily undergraduate research, I mean, sorry, undergraduate institution that um, uses this teacher-scholar model as sort of like, this is what we're looking for. Um, realistically, to be successful, we are looking for candidates who have a, um, a publication record. It doesn't have to be huge, <laughs> you know, but you have to have something to start with. It just shows that you've, you've successfully gotten to that point. Uh, because us as colleagues in, um, uh, at your um, new institution, uh, we can mentor you with teaching and so on, but I'm probably not going to be an expert in your field of research. 
right now you are surrounded by a whole bunch of other people that you can tap to get information on, hey, how do I do this? How do I learn this? And you know, you're surrounded by um, people that have that expertise and can help you with your research. Um, at a Cal State LA or Cal State Channel Islands or any Cal State, you may be the only person in that department that has that particular expertise, right? So we want to make sure that, um, again, that you're set up to be successful. And so a big part of that is just um, making sure that um, you do have that publication record already established because it's telling us that you know how to successfully start and complete a project, how to write it up, how to negotiate and do that whole process with um, uh, dealing with journal editors and get, you know um, revisions and all of that, that you don't that you are ready <laughs> then to, to kind of go forward from there. Bonus is if you have existing data um, that can help you, you know, transition um, to a different atmosphere where maybe the pace of data collection might be, you know, just realistically is going to be slower than what you're used to doing right now. Um, so that is really helpful. It's really helpful if um, you have a plan for how you will do your scholarship, whether that means how am I, when am I going to write, you know, a book? When am I going to have time to do this? Or when am I, when and how am I going to um, do my data collection? That you have a plan. Um, so that's, that's something that's really important. So I think I mentioned earlier, no, we, don't ha we do not have an MRI <laughs> um, at Cal State Channel Islands. Um, so realistically, if that is your area of research, um, you need to have a plan for how that's going to work, right? Because we don't, again, we don't want to kill your dreams, you know? <laughs> we don't want to hire someone with a great trajectory and great expertise doing something that we can't support you in. So the plan might be, oh, I will continue, you know, collaborating with others that will provide me this access to an MRI machine or whatever else it might be. Um, uh, or I have a plan to transition to look at the same research questions, um, but maybe looking at it um, with, um, you know, different types of, um, uh, you know, equipment and maybe kind of a little bit of a lower, um, you know, tech approach. So, um, you know, it is something that sort of um, you want to kind of plan for. How am I going to be able to do research at a school that maybe doesn't have the same level of research support? Um, so, you know, in, in, when I started at um, the small university in New Mexico, one of the first things I did was I wrote uh, just a very, very small grant um, to get some equipment. Um, and because it was a small, modest grant and so on, I was able to get it and get, a, you know, a laboratory up and running. That said, it was a laboratory doing research that I had absolutely no training in <laughs> um, in my doctoral program. Um, so I have, you know, my, my training was... Um, uh, uh, using techniques and so on that I really were not compatible with the primarily undergraduate institution. So I had to kind of retool and um, learn um, other skills that were, you know, were more compatible. So in my case, that meant, you know, psychophysiology as opposed to um, some of the other stuff that I had done in graduate school. And I was happy to make that. But again, if you're not happy, that's not really you want to do because of it's 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 what's it's what you want. Then it's not a good fit for you. You you will resent it, <laughs> right? And I never have. I've always been really happy um, with uh, the choice I made and and how it's worked out. So different forms of scholarship are often possible at an undergraduate institution. Collaborations are often welcome. Um, so in our case, we are smaller. So we have you know I I know folks in every department, um, and there are a lot of uh, you know, opportunities for collaboration with other people on campus. Um, be open about how you explore your research questions, um, you know, so that it doesn't necessarily rely on expensive technology <laughs> um, or access to special facilities um, that are limited. So have a plan for how you can be successful in your research. Can you maybe say, oh, and I would love to do this and that? Sure, absolutely. But make sure that you have a plan to be successful with your scholarship, given the resources that they actually have available, um, or that are realistic, you know, with, with a little bit of funding. And while, while interviewing, um, it's also really good to demonstrate that you can be productive, again, with the resources available. So that's one thing, you know, you want to ask, hey, what do you have as far as facilities? What do you have as far as this? What do you have as far as, you know, whatever, whatever the needs are? Um, 
And so colleges usually do provide some support <laughs> for research, even if they are smaller, even if they are a primarily undergraduate institution. Um, so um, that's just our, our little website. Um, so yeah, we, we do have internal grant funding opportunities that come up twice a year. Um, I think that's pretty typical. Um, we, uh, as part of that, you can get what's called a course release. Um, and that just essentially buys out your time so that you don't have to teach uh, um, one class. Um, so you can dedicate that time to your research. So that's a really common um, internal grant mechanism that we have. You can get a little bit of cash for your project, um, whatever you know, the needs are, and then you get a course release to give you some time. Um, and again, that's just usually internal, easy to get. And um, at least with my experiences, uh, we've been able to fund everybody who's um, applied. And we tend to prioritize the um, folks who are new and do not yet have tenure um, because we want them, again, we want them to be successful. So, but we have been able to fund everybody. Um, so, I th and again, I think that's fairly typical, I hope. Um, the other thing that we do, um, or that you can try and you know, ask questions about, is there an opportunity to teach a smaller course that incorporates a research project into the course? That's win-win. <laughs> so it's part of your required workload. Um, you're doing your research and you're mentoring students in it. Now, it can be a little bit like herding cats if you're trying to do research with 24 students in a class, um, but a little bit of planning, divide up a big project into small projects, and so on, um, and it's amazing what you can do. Um, and so that's something else that's, that's kind of a, you know, a, a way to kind of integrate that teacher and scholar um, approach. So um, it's definitely not for everyone, um, but for some, um, I think it can be uh, a model that can lead to a, a very rewarding um, and satisfying, you know, kind of career path. Um, so I spoke fast, but I did not want to take up all our time because I figured there might be some questions. I don't know if you want to do questions now or at the end. No, let's do them. I say we do them now. Okay. Uh, hi, thank you for coming and for speaking with us. Um, so in the UC system, I know a lot of the ways the university gets money is actually from professors getting grants, mm -hmm. and then the university cuts 50% as overhead and funds a lot of stuff that way. Yeah. Um, and I've heard, I'm not sure if you can uh, affirm this or not, but that the CSU, because of this, is trying to push more and more research activity mm -hmm. um, at the CSU level in order purely for funding purposes. Is this true, and how has that affected your work? It is true, and I, that's a great um, question and comment. Um, so, and that, again, that's something else that is appearing uh, more and more in our requirements for tenure and promotion. It varies by department. Um, so uh, it may be that in some areas, uh, an external grant application um, can count um, can contribute to your scholarship, so it is being encouraged in that sense. Um, uh, at different campuses um, that have different research focuses, it might be more prominent than an R campus um, that does not have that kind of a sort of competitive, um, you know, research type focus. So, um, are we encouraged? Absolutely. <laughs> um, and some campuses, um, uh, for sure, like the Cal Poly. Um, uh, you know, campuses are, I think, much more focused in that realm and might uh, require more external funding of their faculty. Um, for us, it's nice, but not required. So it's encouraged, but not necessary. Um, and really, it's a matter of, um, you know, if an individual wants to pursue that, they are encouraged and helped. Um, we also apply for um, institutional grants that are not individual research projects, but maybe um, to provide, uh, like we're doing something right now to provide uh, more opportunities for um, disadvantaged students to get involved in you know, STEM type research projects with faculty members. So you might be asked to p contribute to a grant, but it's not like your own personal research type grant too. Did that help a little bit? Yes. Okay. Hi, thank you for your time. Um, how do you go about, this is something that's probably one of the most intimidating th thing to me, right, I feel like, right now. How do you go about designing your own course? Or are you expected to have your own course ready when you start your job, I guess? You're expected to have your own course ready the day that classes start? <laughs> yeah. I know. And it's just like, 
you know, no one ever sat me down and said, this is it. <laughs> and I, it's kind of, I, I get to that some of you are getting a little more mentorship and guidance in that, I hope. Um, um, so that's where um, I just really encourage, um, you know, you to reach out to um, your, you know, your colleagues who have <laughs> um, um, taught courses or if you have faculty in the area or, you know, if, if, if it's in psychology, I, I, you know, you can reach out to me and I can certainly um, uh, help you out a little bit. Um, but a lot of, we do have resources on campus once you're there <laughs> to help with that. But we, there is this expectation, you know, we're going to hire you maybe in February, March, April, May, somewhere in there. And by mid-August, we expect you to arrive with your syllabi ready and you're, you know, ready to teach your classes. Um, so <laughs> um, I guess what I would recommend is maybe that first semester, keep it modest, <laughs> you know, um, and then start experimenting from there on. You know, and um, don't underestimate the implicit kinds of um, training that you've gotten already just by being a teaching assistant. I'm sure you've seen different um, ways to, for classes to be structured, um, different little rules about how assignments can be turned in and those kinds of things. So incorporate the practices that um, you feel have worked successfully um, in classes where you've been a TA. Um, and, and build on that. I, I think we, we do know more than we think we do, perhaps, in, the, in that area. But yeah, we don't get a lot of explicit like preparation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So in a similar vein to that question, you, uh, you mentioned that you spend a lot of time doing research with undergraduates, no matter where you are. So I was wondering how one would start going about creating a research project to do with an undergraduate that is at an appropriate level for them that also helps build them up. Yeah, yeah, and if again, if it, if it furthers your research agenda, yay, <laughs> really nice. Um, I, I've seen it in different ways, um, and it depends on the discipline, and you know, in, in some areas it's easier than in others. For me, it's really easy. Um, I need my students to collect data. <laughs> um, so I have a colleague in um, biology, for him it's the same thing, you know, he'll train his students to do um, observations of bees <laughs> um, out in the environment. So, um, you know, it's kind of comparable in that way. We can train our students to do um, the sort of the, the everyday data collection um, processes. Um, and typically what we do is we'll start off, um, say if it's, a, if it's a semester long course, you know, we'll, we'll have several readings at the start of the semester for them to develop that theoretical background and then, you know, develop kind of like what would be like an introduction to a paper. And I always have my students write that introduction um, at some point during the semester. And then they might um, do some data collection. Um, and then, you know, depending on where they're at, they might do the analysis, typically not. Um, and then we can, we can kind of put together like a little project that might be a, a pilot study. It might be, um, uh, a follow-up study just kind of depends on you know where you are in learning about whatever the the topic is. Um, so if you can have students for two semesters, that's awesome because you can train them one semester and keep them the second semester, and um, you can you know get a lot more productivity <laughs> um, out of them that way. Um, uh, and then what uh, the other thing that ends up happening too that's really nice, you will have students that have done maybe a year-long research experience with you who are, they did it when they were juniors. Now they're seniors and they can sort of provide a lot of the training to the individual students as well. So it's not as hard as you think, but again, a lot of it depends on just wh what your research is. Um, for some faculty that don't, collect data or that do things that are, you know, a little bit different, um, the student might be more involved in like literature reviews and stuff. So it just kind of depends on the field a little bit. I think okay, so I wanted to thank you again for yeah, bringing you. your knowledge and wisdom and advice. <laughs>